starts right now. You've probably noticed it's cooling down very quickly in San Antonio. The front has hit and we're feeling the effects. So how low will it go? Let's get to meteorologist Adam Kasky for the latest. Adam? Yeah, it's hard to believe that just a handful of hours ago we were right near 80 degrees here in San Antonio. Now we're down to 53 and quickly falling. North wind has kicked in. That's the cold front. It's steady at 14 miles per hour and even gusting up to 22. So we're feeling the wind and that's pushing in the colder air. So when we wake up, we'll be right around 40 degrees. A little bit of dampness as well. We'll have some sprinkles and it's just going to be blustery. A windy and cold day tomorrow. A north wind likely at 15 to 25. Even a slight chance of some wet snowflakes by tomorrow night. I'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. But one thing to remember, we will have a quick temperature rebound. The whole forecast coming right up. Up and down we go. Thank you, Adam. Textot also watching the weather tonight. Here's a live look at Trans Guide. Earlier today, we're told crews were prepping for any winter weather conditions ahead. Drivers always reminded to watch your speed. Make sure you keep enough distance between you and the car in front of you. Two other news at 10. A Southwest community worried about its safety after an early morning fire for some of them out of their homes. Arson investigators trying to determine the exact cause of that fire near General Hudnell and Billy Mitchell. As the night team's Patty Santos reports, this isn't the first fire at this apartment complex. By the time I came to see it, that fire spread quick. It was huge, fast. It was scary, very scary. Bridget Morales was one of six families displaced by an early morning fire at the Preserve at the Port Apartments Tuesday morning. My neighbor upstairs, she came banging on our doors, letting us know because I didn't hear anything. The building where the fire started on the 400 block of Cropsey Avenue was vacant, but it's connected to an occupied building. Didn't know what to expect, just being take nothing out, just our dog and our kids. After more than three hours, families and units that were not burned were allowed to go back home, but some quickly realized it was a bad idea. Just kept letting like smoke and then it affected us. How, what were the symptoms that you guys were feeling? Itchy eyes, um, itchy throat, coughing, and just like wanted to throw up. A few are seeking safety outside of their homes tonight. I'm taking my voucher that Red Cross gave me and I'm going to look for another apartment. But this isn't the first time fires have impacted families in this apartment complex. In 2018, nearly a dozen vehicles under a port in that complex caught fire. That same year, crews responded to a two alarm fire that affected 20 units. In 2017, a man was killed in an apartment fire and others were displaced in yet another fire. Hi, ma'am. Management declined to speak with us. Online reports show there have been six arson police reports in that area surrounding the apartment complex since June of 2017. <laughs> Tenants are concerned this latest fire might have been intentional. I fear for my life because that person is still out there. And it's unclear how long it will take investigators to determine the cause of that fire. We do know that that happened very early in the morning. It was a two alarm fire, and we also know that it was about $100,000 in damages. Steve Isis. Thank you, Patty. New on the night beat a shake up for the city of Leon Valley. The Leon Valley police chief will serve as the interim city manager. The city council making that decision tonight after accepting the resignation of its current city manager. Kelly Kinsler has served in that position since 2015. Her resignation will go into effect on May the 1st. The city council voted four to one to approve police chief Joe Salvaggio to serve as interim for 18 months. That means the assistant Assistant Police Chief Ruben Saucedo will serve as interim police chief. Kinsler said she is not leaving her post due to the city's recent turmoil. She lost her life at the young age of seven. Tonight, family and friends remembered Avery Favela. During a candlelight vigil, Avery died in a crash on Highway 90 over the weekend. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with her family, who is just trying to cope with this unexpected loss. Even when you're serving God, the question was like, how can it happen to Tonight you? was a somber night for the family and friends of seven-year-old Avery Favela, a little girl who was killed in a major crash on Highway 90 Saturday evening. Her middle name says it all, Faith. It is that faith that brought loved ones together during a candlelight vigil held near the location of the crash site. Pink balloons representing Avery's favorite color and a unicorn that she loved were present tonight in honor of this happy and joyful child. 
she reminded me of my daughter. She was always very cheerful and she just loved being surrounded by her family. And Avery, we will see you one day in heaven. We'd always love to go shopping. And then after church, we would always go get bean and cheese tacos. Her grandmother, Edna Arce, says when she got the call, she rushed to the hospital where Avery's mother and stepfather were also being treated for their injuries. They were pretty, you know, beaten up, broken ribs, you know, bruises, there was blood. I mean, it, it was just, I don't remember all the details. I just know they were in really bad shape. So to see them both here, I'm, although it's a bad situation about my granddaughter, but I'm also blessed to still be holding my daughter. She says the pain in their hearts outweigh their physical pain. Arce says though they are hurting, they are blessed by the support from those who loved Avery. It's a blessing to know that she was loved by so many people and that's what every child should have. She says if she had one message for others. Love your family every day because you never know when it'll be your last. Just keep loving each other in case that's the last time you get to see them. And of course, just always have faith in God. The family says that Avery's viewing and rosary will be held this Thursday. Her burial scheduled for Friday. San Antonio police say this investigation is still under investigation. Steve Isis. Thank you, Jaffney. It's been nearly a year since a warrant was issued for this man's arrest and authorities still don't know where he is. He's wanted on a charge of child sexual assault. Deputy U.S. Marshal Chris Bozeman tells us about this case in tonight's Crime Fighters report. Tonight we need your help because Gilbert Garza is a fugitive and wanted by the United States Marshal Service Lone Star Fugitive Task Force for having an active arrest warrant involving sexual assault of a child. Back in March of last year, a warrant was issued for Garza's arrest following an indictment filed with the Bexar County 437th District Court. The indictment alleged that Garza sexual assault of a child through physical force and contact. The victim was under the age of 17 years old. Garza is a Hispanic male. He's 45 years of age. He has black hair and brown eyes. He stands six feet tall and weighs approximately 190 pounds. His last known place of residence was on the north side of San Antonio. If you have any information that can lead to his arrest, contact the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force at 210-657-8500. And remember, a tip from you tonight can help track down this predator. Garza isn't the only fugitive wanted right now. To see other people we feature, just head to our website, ksat.com. We're also looking into what's next for the convicted medical center rapist, Anton Harris. He was sentenced to 99 years for that 2017 rape case, but he was also indicted in four other cases in the medical center area. The district attorney now faced with three options when it comes to moving forward with those cases. They include going to trial, talking about a plea bargain, or dismissing the cases. Our Paul Venema has the backstory online right now on KSAT.com. Well, Saws is reminding San Antonio not to throw wipes or rags down the drain. Crews found the debris along with a tree stump in one of their pipes. This was near West Avenue in Bitters. Saws posted the pictures online. It is a reminder that Saws is in charge of 12,000 miles of pipes under San Antonio right now. So they say it's important not to flush these types of objects down the drain. Not only can they lead to stoppages, they can also damage equipment. It should never happen again. The chairman of the Democratic National Committee calling for a transparent account on what led to the technical issues that led to delayed results in the Iowa caucus. Partial results were released today, nearly 24 hours after yesterday's caucuses kicked off. Again, these are just partial numbers. The numbers show Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders leading that contest. Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden and Amy Klobuchar are trailing, at least for now. It's unclear when the full results will actually be released. The Bear County Elections Office says they do not anticipate any issues using its new technology and voting machines in March. Other than some reporting delays, nothing like the delays in Iowa. Our local elections office and elections administrator says their systems worked as expected last November. Election staff have also spent two weeks testing out those machines. And if an issue does arise, the elections administrator says there's a backup system. A side note. Iowa holds caucuses run by the political parties, not primaries overseen by election officials like we do in Bear County. He's still ahead on the night beat the president giving his third State of the Union address on the eve of what's expected to be the end of his impeachment trial. 
There was some tension in the room. The highlights coming up. And the coronavirus leading to more deaths in China. Here in the U.S., we're learning a child was rushed to the hospital after being quarantined. The latest coming up next on The Night Beat. The death toll in China rising to 490 because of the new coronavirus. The number of cases growing to more than 24,000 with patients being moved into new or converted hospitals in China. Meanwhile, Americans evacuated from the country remain quarantined tonight. We're now learning a child under quarantine at the March Air Reserve Base in Southern California was taken to the hospital. That child was part of the first group of evacuees and was tested at least three times. A swab test was taken yesterday and is being reviewed by the Centers for Disease Control. Officials call it an abundance of caution. We've also learned a traveler who arrived to Los Angeles from China was moved to the March Air Reserve base and has been isolated from the rest of the group under quarantine there. JBSA Lackland is providing temporary housing for the potential arrival of passengers from China. Tomorrow, they'll host a town hall for JBSA personnel and their families. President Donald Trump's third State of the Union address filled with many topics from the economy, health care. He even mentioned the Alamo in tonight's speech. But it was the start of the State of the Union address that first caught the attention of a lot of people. President Donald Trump handing out a copy of his speech to Vice President Mike Pence, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She reached out to get a copy and a handshake. It's unclear if the president ignored her or just didn't see her put her hand out. Tensions have been high as the impeachment trial continues. Moving on, border security became one big issue the president addressed in his speech. He spoke about the border wall and legislation on border policy. The president also turned to health care. I've also made an ironclad pledge to American families. We will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions. You hear some jeering there. That's from Democrats pointing at the president and yelling, likely referencing his Justice Department's decision to fight the Affordable Care Act, which currently is the only law to protect pre-existing conditions. Another highlight from tonight, President Donald Trump ends his speech, and you see House Speaker Nancy Pelosi ripping up the speech in half behind him. It's been 111 days since the two met in person or even spoke. A reminder, it was Speaker Pelosi who led the charge have Donald Trump impeached. Meanwhile, the president's impeachment trial is expected to come to a close with a vote tomorrow. The Senate would need a two-thirds majority to convict him of abusing his power and obstructing Congress. While he is expected to be acquitted, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin has floated the idea of censoring President Trump instead, but that proposal has not been able to move forward. All right, let's take a live look outside. You know, when we last left you at 6 o'clock, it was what? In the 70s. 20 so, degrees yeah. warmer than it is right now. Yeah, we were in the 70s then, even, you know, just south of town. We made it into the low 80s. Pleasanton made it up to 81 degrees. Del Rio was 87 earlier today. Then the cold front hit. Yeah. And it hit hard. Fair. It's a real deal cold front. We're feeling it. But the effects aren't going to be really long lasting. That's the key here. Tomorrow's our day where you want to bundle up a bit, but then we rebound nicely. So let's talk about it here. And first take a look at this cold front, the one that hit us a couple of hours ago. It's a strong one, yes, but to put it in perspective, we'll take our high temperatures from about 80 degrees down into the 40s tomorrow, and morning low temperatures will be dipping down into the 30s. Even here in San Antonio, I think we'll make it down to the freezing point, not tomorrow morning, but as we get into Thursday morning. So let's talk numbers, 55 in Hondo, still 60 in Pleasanton, but then 50 Canyon Lake and Bulverde and in the 40s already in parts of the Hill Country and Junction now 39, Ozona 36. You see that colder air to the north, it's filtering southward and spilling southward all because of this cold front. At five o'clock today, I had this front drawn basically through about Kerrville and Rock Springs. Clearly it's made some progress southward and it's pulling in this colder air. And look at that colder air. In the Panhandle, we're in the 20s right now. Amarillo 22, Lubbock at 24, even Abilene just one degree above freezing. Midland at 30 degrees. Yeah, clearly a strong cold front and our friends in North Texas, they're really feeling the effects of this. Not just cold, but of course, windy as well. We've got sustained winds around 10 to 20 miles per hour. So of course it's very brisk and blustery out there. You'll have to plan for the cold 
and the wind throughout the day tomorrow, and it's going to be hauling pretty much all day. So here are the main points. Jacket weather tomorrow morning at the bus stop. I know kids have been wearing shorts and short sleeves the past few days. Completely different story tomorrow. Windy and cold, temperatures in the 40s all day, and a north wind steady at 15 to 25. So it's going to feel like it's in the 30s when you factor in that wind. As for rain, I think we'll have some sprinkles, a few light showers off and on in nature for about the first half of the day. And then as we get into tomorrow night, yeah, maybe a few wet snowflakes, a few sleep pellets here and there. So let's talk more about that. Let's talk about the precipitation and what we can expect going forward. We just have the clouds right now. A few isolated sprinkles and light showers in Valverde County. That's it. But you look into North Texas where the colder air is and they still have some snow. Snow earlier today, just south of Amarillo and Canyon, Randall County there five inches measured and now we've got another batch of snow that's overspreading parts of West Texas there. So they're feeling the real wintry precipitation around here. It's going to be very limited. So tomorrow morning we'll have the low clouds and a few spotty sprinkles. That's about it. We get into the midday hour, still low clouds and a few sprinkles. Just a little bit of dampness for the first part of the day. But into the afternoon, I do think we could clear out a little bit. See 4 p.m. You might see a bit of sunshine, but then our next batch of energy and moisture slides in from Mexico and that should cause some areas of rain tomorrow night. This is after the evening rush hour and with it some colder air, maybe a light wintry mix, especially in the hill country. And I wouldn't even rule out a few uh, pockets of wet snowflakes mixing in in parts of northern Bear County. No travel impacts, no travel troubles, just that wow factor and our window of opportunity for this basically from about 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., I think, at least for Bear County. Some elevated surfaces in the northern hill country could have some slick spots, but for the most part, again, just for a few hours tomorrow night, a little bit of a wow factor out there. That would be it. All right, so here's your day planner. 40 in the morning, 44 at noon, and we only make it to about 48 for the high temperature with that gusty north wind. Temperatures rebound pretty quickly, though. We'll be off to full sunshine on Thursday despite, despite a cold start at 32 Ooh. we'll be right near 60 into the afternoon and by Friday sunny and 71 amazing all right thanks so much Adam mm -hmm. all right usually when you're the home team or usually when you play back-to-back -back games in the same arena you're the home team true not for the Spurs no not tonight because they had the Clippers last night the Lakers tonight after LaMarcus Aldridge scored 27 last night, 0 for 5 in the first half tonight. So it's a tough set of back-to-backs against the top two teams in the Western Commerce. Highlights when we come back. And the Spurs trade rumors are for the trade deadline on Thursday. After scoring 27 points for the 108 to 105 loss to the Clippers last night in Los Angeles, LaMarcus Aldridge and the Spurs have to go up against the best in the West tonight, the Lakers. Spurs off to another good start, though. DeMar DeRozan crosses over Anthony Davis, delivered the floater in the lane. Rudy Gay off the back of the iron, but Lonnie Walker, the fourth inside for the putback jam, tied at 19 all just before the end of the first quarter. Davis over LaMarcus, and the Lakers take a 21 19 lead going into that second quarter. In the second period, Derek White finds DeMar the bounce pass, it results in the reverse layup, but the Lakers open up a double-digit lead when LeBron throws it down. That made it a 10-point lead in the second. We're now in the third quarter, and that lead is expanding now. Lakers out in front of the Spurs 67-51 on the second game of the rodeo road trip. The Spurs are shopping Damari Carroll before the NBA trade deadline this Thursday, according to a number of reports, and it makes sense. He's only played in 15 games this season after signing a three-year $21 million deal with the Spurs, but his guaranteed money of $7 million this year and $8 million next year may be too much. That's after they were rebuffed by Marcus Morris, who are negative on a two-year, $20 million deal with the Spurs to sign a one-year, $15 million contract with the Knicks. Now, Morris is also being mentioned in trade talks for the Knicks. The NBA is changing the format for this season's three-point contest during All-Star Saturday in Chicago, adding a pair of deep shots. They'll be worth three points apiece. The league making that announcement tonight that says the change means each round will now be a total of 27 shots instead of 25. Competitors will get 70 seconds to finish their shots instead of one minute. The two additional shots will come from six feet beyond the three-point line and be taken with a green ball. The reason for the change to mirror players making 300 shots from at least 30 feet this season. 
Vanessa Bryant, the widow of Kobe Bryant, has requested items left at the memorial to her late husband and her daughter Gianna at the Staples Center. The president of Staples Center, Lee Zeidman, told the LA Times that Mrs. Bryant has requested T-shirts, letters, basketball, stuffed animals, and toys left by the fans, so they are going to catalog every one of them, place them in a specially made container, and ship them to the family. Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter were among nine people killed in a helicopter crash in California one week ago this past Sunday. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL Draft is one of the biggest moments in sports, and you can count Mayor Ron Nirenberg, who believes San Antonio should host the major event. Last year, nationally, the NFL Drafts have both attendance and viewership records, and even though San Antonio doesn't have an NFL team, the mayor still believes the Alamo City is the right city to host a future NFL Draft starting perhaps in 2022. We are a destination city. Uh, we pull off major sporting events better than any city in the country, and that uh, has been on display for a long, long time. You know, it makes sense. I've been thinking about that for a long time. We're a major sporting venue for these large events, and, and uh, that would be a, a, a step in the right direction for us. And the Chiefs have returned to Kansas City with head coach Andy Reid leading the team, holding the Lombardi Trophy. The first for the Chiefs in 50 years as Super Bowl champs. Their victory parade is set for tomorrow, 1130 in the morning. During the Region 20 gathering, high school football coaches and athletic directors for the University Interscholastic League realignment announcement on Monday, we notice a very familiar face. You know who this is? This is Dave Aranda, the new head coach of Baylor in San Antonio. He's hired by the Bears after the Carolina Panthers scooped up Matt Rule to become their new head coach and after Aranda helped lead LSU to the national championship as their defensive coordinator. So we wanted to know what has the past couple of weeks been like since he was introduced. First, you talk about getting to know the team and introducing yourself and um, integrating into that culture and, and putting your own spin on that culture. And then you got to build, hire a staff. You got to finish out recruiting. A lot of those things are all happening at the same time. Some of that's starting to slow down, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we'll be able to here after uh, Wednesday spend a little bit more time with the team and start developing our uh, 2020 football team. Also on hand to meet with the San Antonio high school coaches was new UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer. High school basketball playoffs just around the corner. District showdowns next. The Roosevelt Rough Riders looking to stay undefeated in District 27-6A tonight behind 6'11 Jared Hall taking on South San in third place. Hall is a beast on the court looking to go in the lane with a jump hook to get the Rough Riders out to a great start. But even with the Riders' dominance inside, the Bobcats are great from the outside. The three by Derek Sanchez to keep it close. Now the Riders' Corey Jackson takes it in to deliver the dish to Rashad Owens who takes it in for the slam. You remember his name from his success on the football field. The Rough Riders score a 46-42 victory to go 10-0 in District. Girls basketball now in Medina Valley Panthers came to visit the Hawks at Harlan tonight. Battle of the two best teams in that district, 28-5A. Only one district loss between them. The Hawks jump out to a big lead in the first behind Ariel Gordon's nice update to give her a room to drive and deliver the jumper. Her teammate, Layla Conley, is able to find Janae Henry. Now the Panthers try and get back into this game as Addison Ginther gets open for her three-point shot, but the Hawks go to 14-0 in district with a final of 66-32. I hope the heaters were working in the gyms tonight. Well, luckily, the these weather. games were early. So oh, so they weren't was, after this. They, they weren't quite when the cold front hit. All right. Thanks, Greg. Sure. We'll be right back. A familiar painting with a twist. This piece of this piece is called Rubik Mona Lisa, and as the name describes, it was made up of 330 Rubik's cubes. The anonymous French street artist known only as Invader created the piece in 2005 and now Rubik Mona Lisa will be auctioned off in Paris on February 23rd. Experts at the auction house think it could go for about $166,000. You know, I'm no art expert, but I think that is a great example of cubism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm holding it, it in. Didn't go over. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well, Greg. <laughs> All right, so blustery and cold tomorrow, some sprinkles and maybe a few wet flakes or sleet pellets mixed in tomorrow night. That'd be very brief, mainly in the hill country. A cold Thursday morning, but temperatures rebound nicely thereafter. See, Greg's idea of cubism are ice cubes. Mm. It is a drink. Can't all be winners. <laughs>